Good day, citizens, and welcome to this week's podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. You are all welcome. I'm glad you are with us. This week we talk about listener mail. We get a lot of it, and it's fascinating. And 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 David, some of it is just fun. It is. <laughs> some of it is just fun about you know, different types of um, plants and melons that Jefferson grew and my new ukulele. and We got a, a question we had to answer from Susanna Ordry about a specific type of melon that Pat Brodowski, and it's, you know, in these cold weather days, I like to think I had a whole garden around the corner. So we had to answer that. And we got a lot of mail, and, and I hope we get more about Robert Kagan's extraordinarily important short book, uh, the Jungle Grows Back, about uh, the post-World War II settlement, what he calls the liberal world order, not to be confused with liberals like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, liberals used in another sense here, and what happens if the United States, which is the world's unipower and hegemon, if we begin to pull back from our presence in those troubled places in Asia and mostly in Europe. And so I think that book is must reading for every American. It helps to explain the Trump phenomenon, among other things, but that's not its main purpose. And I hope people will read it and respond. We even got a text as I walked into the barn from none other than Brad Crisler of Nashville objecting to one sentence in the book. And then we tried. Well, it wasn't really to, the objecting, it was just kind saying, of shocked. Yeah, it's a little, a little, because what, what, basically what, Robert Kagan says is that order is important and you at times you may have to let order be brought by authoritarian governments because disorder is so much more violent and convulsive. And so that, of course, is always something that's hard to swallow. But that's not the thesis of the book. The thesis is that America does an enormous amount of good in the world and that the cost of all of that, however big it might seem to the American taxpayer, is a bargain compared to the kind of madness and wars that would happen and will happen. Putin, we know, massing troops in Ukraine and on the border of Ukraine, interested in getting back the Baltic states. If he had, if there were no America, I believe that Putin would already have invaded the Baltic states and taken back all or much of Ukraine. So we play, it's the post-Cold War, but it's a new kind of Cold War. And our presence in Europe, in Germany, and in France, and in Britain, and in Italy, and so on, through the post-war period, has had a stabilizing effect, and it effectively has prevented another conflagration from breaking out, at least in Western Europe. And so Kagan's view is, you may not really love this role, and you might have thought that it's, it's time for the United States to pull away, but be careful here, because if you get that you may wind up having to go back with arms and firepower and not just presence. We, we've got a number of book suggestions that we talked about on the really show. Really good ones. Yeah, one of uh, George Washington one. Oh, uh, that's The Indispensable Man by Robert Flexner, which is a book I've read three or four times, and it's a great biography of Washington. And uh, Eager, The Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. Which I have not read, Goldfarb. And as I said, it's on my favorite reader's nightstand. I will get it now. Yeah, uh, and there was one other, oh yeah, Dallas Cole from uh, Liquid Us or Liquid US, I'm not sure. I'm which. intrigued by Liquid Us or Liquid US. I need to find out much more about that. I'll, I'll hand off these. Uh, these. Thank you. It might be something that we want to come back to. Or maybe huh? we want someone from that movement to well, be on the show. He makes a suggestion that we might want to. So you have called for the 2019 Jefferson Hour to be focused more on the Constitution, how it works, because you think it's quite important that citizens are aware. We're, we're being drawn into a, a gigantic constitutional crisis. So we're we're going to get into that, and this might fit really well with that. So we need so. to know the Constitution. We need to know what's yeah. in it, yeah. and not just what's in it, but, but Akil... Amar, this scholar at Yale that I'm, I really admire. Oh, that's that's coming up, isn't that's it? That's our pretty book soon. club. Yeah, it's coming. And up he really has soon. a number of books, a biography of the Constitution. He has a, a book about the future of the Constitution, but he also has one called the Living Constitution, and it's about the Constitution that's not in the text itself. It's the way we constitute ourselves, right? And those things are as important as the text 
that was produced in I'm, 1787. I'm in the midst of that book right now, and I'm, I'm really anxious for that show. Really interesting. I really admire him. I want to get him on this program. I've worked with him before. He's uh, he's become eminent more than he was. And even. maybe Kagan, too, right? And Kagan's coming. Yeah. Uh, he and I have been corresponding. I know a friend of a friend, and Kagan has said, yes, he was in Europe right now. He spends a lot of time in Europe, but he wants to come on this show. That's a huge thing. Because I want to ask him about the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson. So, you know, he's really about the 20th and the 21st centuries. But he said something on an interview that I saw with Neil Conan of NPR. He said that America's idea of itself is was born in the Declaration of Independence. And so, bingo, that's our man. I want to get him on and talk about that. And I think he's going to say that's mostly good, but I think he's going to be an Adamsite. <laughs> I think he's going to say, that sounds great, but uh, it's harder to make happen than you might think. With that, uh, I want to thank everybody for writing us. I have a, a large stack, as you can attest to, of letters. We didn't get to everything. We will keep them and pick up that subject of letter answering. Before you drop soon. the octave in your— oh, Am I doing that? No, but you're about to. Let me say that there are still a couple of places for the— John Steinbeck Cultural Tour, March 2 through 8. Are you sure? Yes, just a couple. You, you, uh, a week or so ago, you said there's only five. Have you I checked? Know, and I have, and there's still a couple, and I want people to come because I'm so excited about it. Well, I know how much you enjoy that, and Plus, you're good at it, Plus, this is California in March. I can't even see you because of my breath is freezing and <laughs> cracking here oh, in the it's bar. it's not that bad. A cow went by me, and it's it was bratwurst. It's bad. It is that bad. With that killer cold, it's time to go to the show. Yeah, let's let's hear the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. Joining us this week on the Thomas Jefferson Hour is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Good to see you, sir. Still cold on the northern plains. Yeah, well, we had a little respite over the weekend. You know, it's supposed to be cold. You know, I just. People get to, oh, it's awful. Say, you no, know, it's February. In a month, we'll be deciding what seeds to plant and start. Jefferson, as, as you know, we went. We need to call Pat Brodowski pretty soon. Excuse me. Jefferson went to New England in 1791 with Madison on his famous botanizing tour. And he said in a letter to his daughter, Martha, no rational being would live here. Uh, he said, I, I need warmth. Imagine if you could airlift Jefferson into. Um, International Falls, Minnesota today, or Bemidji, or even Harvey or Minot, <laughs> North Dakota. I have the, I have this I have this image of Thomas Jefferson in a parking lot spitting up into the air. Where did that come uh -huh, from? Yeah. <laughs> Jefferson would probably have his thermometer. Yeah. And you know, he did not know the idea of the wind chill factor. No, that, but it would be this phenomena that he could look into and study. Oh, I know he but he he wouldn't do the spitting. He would get Madison to spit <laughs> and Jefferson would be with his measuring stick and well, the, the his, one his that, thermometer. Well, the one you do is you take a glass of water. Have you ever done this? Throw it up. Have you ever done this? Spit? No, thrown water in, in a blizzard. Yeah, I have thrown water. What happens? Oh, if, if it's cold enough, you can throw a cup of water into the air and it immediately crystallizes. That's not true. So It is. It is not. It's like, remember when you said you saw the bobcat or whatever, you the owl? You know, here we go again. I'll tell you what's fun, though. Yeah, go, you, do you know how many people came out and defended me yeah, on that? Yeah, three. I, yeah, yeah. Go to— You were on the losing side of that Go one. to a department store and buy a big unit of, of um, bubble. You know that you blow with the oh yeah. You take that out in a blizzard, and blow bubbles, and it is literally true that they go like four feet and then they shatter from the cold. It is fun to watch because oh, if it they, gets cold enough. I'll try that one. That that now that one works. That whole thing about the water. I want you to take water out tonight with a video camera and a witness. And prove that you are right because you are, sir, you're making that up. Uh, tonight I'm busy. I'm yeah, sorry. exactly. Um, you're busy till June. We have just this wonderful stack of letters. Let's the hear subject them. that I think we got the most mail on was a book that you recommended called The Jungle Grows Back. And I just got a by text. By Robert Kagan. Yes, and I saw him on television last night. It's an old interview from 2004, uh -huh. right after the beginning of the Iraq War. He was on with uh, Neil Conan of NPR. It was fascinating. I, would, I watched for an hour and 20 minutes. This is a really extraordinary man. But just as I walked into the barn, I got a text from none other than Chrysler. Brad Chrysler, our, our friend, friend in Nashville. From Nashville. And, he, and he said, whoa, W-H-O-A. I didn't realize he was a, an equestrian. 
And then he quoted this sentence from The Jungle Grows Back. Authoritarianism may be a stable condition of human existence. And he's apparently objecting to that. But Kagan says, trying to analyze the world situation, that authoritarianism may be a stable condition of human existence. And I think Chrysler is saying, no, not not on board with that kind of a pronouncement. So we're getting a lot of response is my point. Well, let's let's start with so Chrysler let's hear then. Okay. Let's start with Chrysler then. Why don't you respond to that? Cuz that's what he does say in the book. He's 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 challenging our views of we're the good guys. I know well, yes, Kagan is is it, here's Kagan's point of view in a nutshell that order matters. That if you look at the sad history of Europe, it's mayhem, especially the two mega wars of the 20th century. And the, the conditions that we're living in right now are sort of an aberration. It's right. not normal, because right? Because that's the norm. Yeah. People at each other's throats about land, about religion, about economics, about the whims of kings or monarchs or aristocrats, that the norm in European history has been mayhem, war, persecution, Chaos, which I, I find absolutely fascinating and true to end up on the Jefferson Hour, because to me it was Jefferson's view that we left that behind in Europe and we created this new world where that could no longer exist. That the point of America was to get beyond that. Right, Jefferson thought we left all that madness behind that it, it continued to exist in Europe. But that was not us, that we had graduated out of it into the Enlightenment and in what he likes to call this our happy republic, we were going to be better than that. We were going to graduate into a higher form of tolerance and forbearance and uh, due process and, and, and rule by law and so on. Well, <laughs> I just have to say before we go on, uh, ask the Cherokee, ask the Seminole, ask the Crow. Ask the Lakota, ask the Mandan. They would not agree about that. Just about every ethnic group in America. We were maybe never quite that people. But Jefferson thought we either were or were going to be. And most of us Americans do have this view that on the whole, we're the class act of the world. We're better. We're high-minded. We're idealistic. We try to do the right thing. Yes, we've had some mistakes. But then on the whole, America is a better world, a better model of human civilization than everything else that came before it, and that we should be justly proud of this. This is sort of one source of American exceptionalism. And the age we're living in now is sort of shaking that very hard. So Europe in, in the 20th century got at each other's throats and killed off 60 or 70 or 100 million people, um, including, of course, the final solution of Hitler and, and Nazi Germany to try to exterminate the Jewish world. Stalin killed 20 or 30 million of his own people in his pogroms and in his attempts to enforce his view of, of the centralized communist state. It's not a pretty picture. Kagan's view is that after all of that, after the unbelievable shock of World War I, which was one of the most damaging things that ever happened to the sense of Europe of itself, and then the follow-up war, World War II. After that, the United States, as the victor, the hegemon, stepped in and said, we're going to create the UN, NATO, the European community, another set of alliances and economic systems, and we're going to create a liberal world order, and the United States is going to be the guarantor of that order, We'll station troops in Europe. We'll have nuclear weapons ready. We'll have the largest uh, military establishment in the history of the world. We're going to take it upon ourselves, beginning with the Marshall Plan and seeing through the Cold War, we're going to guarantee order and peace in the world. Not alone, but we'll be the major figure. That's, that's the basis of it. And here's the final part of that, David. Kagan's view is, uh-oh. America's beginning to weary of that and to pull back, and that would be the greatest disaster that we could ever undertake. You did a great essay on this uh, a few oh, weeks ago, um, and, and in it you said, Kagan says America has become weary of its role as the supervisor and fiscal agent for the liberal world order. It's expensive. Our allies don't seem to pull their own weight, and they often criticize us for the hard work we do 
to protect their interests and territorial integrity and, you know, became sort of a political football. We're not the policemen for the world. You know, it was a, an easy catchphrase. But, you know, I've been communicating with Robert Kagan. I know of a friend of a friend of his, and he's going to come on the Jefferson Hour. Terrific. And he's so, I, and I, when I watched him the other night um, on C-SPAN or on PBS, um, I had, I started to formulate questions that I want to ask him because he's, he, he headquarters a lot of America's sense of itself as something better, a break with that madness. He ha- he headquarters it in Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. So I really want to have him on this program and, and talk with him about this. But, he- but let me reiterate the point. Order matters. And so he is saying here, this is what got Chrysler upset, and it should, but he's saying authoritarianism, of course we all know what's wrong with it, but it does have a way of making the trains run on time and it keeps that world order. And I think he would say, and in fact he said something like this on this program, in some sense Iraq was better off under Saddam Hussein, however awful he was, than after America broke that society of 30 million people and now look at it just utter madness and chaos. America is based on individualism. It's, you know... Don't get in my way. Give me, give me a fair and level playing field. Don't tread on me. Just let me pursue and happiness. And I can do it myself. And and, and uh, Americans are very skeptical of the rest of the world. Right. We don't want to be involved particularly. It's our leaders who have involved us. And I think a lot of people, and this is why Donald Trump, one reason why he was so successful is he said nuts to that. We're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to fight all these wars. We're not going to guarantee the peace. We're not going to be the only the main funder of NATO and other things. We're not. We're just not going to be that. We don't have to be. They should do it themselves. But the long range view of that was well. You create Mar- uh, the Marshall Plan. You create NATO, and you ensure a peaceful future for our nation. And it's a bargain, says Kagan. Whatever kinda, that costs, it kind of worked. It's a bargain. It yeah. worked. It worked. Yeah. And, and he says he doesn't. He's not. This is not an anti. Trump book, uh, The Jungle Grows Back. Trump comes up, but so does so does uh, Barack Obama and so does Bill Clinton. And Kagan's view is, as America wearies of this role because there's been such a long peace and Europe is so prosperous, Kagan says it's almost impossible to think that Europe could ever have another major war. He says now that the stability is kind of inbred into the European world, Americans want to stop doing it. They think, why Why should we do this when Europe appears to be just fine? War in, um, between France and Germany or between Germany and Poland or Russia and, and uh, Czechoslovakia now appears to be um, an impossibility. And so he's saying Americans have tired of this. But what Kagan's answer to that is, Oh, no. Putin's just waiting for that. Putin is just waiting for that moment. We'll get back to that. We need to take a short break uh, in just a moment. But I was going to start with some of the letters, and the very first one was from Christina Hogarth, who uh, apologizes that she drives a lot while listening to the show and wanted you to restate the title and the author. But she did not drive off the road. No. The Jungle Grows Back by Robert Kagan. And she wants to know if it's part of the book club or just a suggested read. It's just a read. suggested read, but I do urge every single person, and I, these are the books I gave away at Loxlaw Lodge last week, I encourage everyone who cares about this country, who loves the Jefferson Hour, and who's worried about where we are as a nation to read The Jungle Grows Back by Robert Kagan. It's short. It's mercifully short. You can read it in a single evening. She also wanted to know one about water rights. That's harder. Um, she should read Mark Reisner's Cadillac Desert. We'll put that on the website. Mark Reisner, R-E-I-S-N-E-R, Cadillac Desert. And uh, can you help me with book titles and authors? Well, you kind of do that well, all the time. We'll put some of those on the website. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'm going to nominate the books for the next cultural retreats next winter, the American Space Program, and also four great novels by Charles Dickens. Right now, we're going to take that short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Hello, listeners. We just wanted to sneak in one of our announcements between segments. People love the books that we recommend on this program, so we have instituted the Thomas Jefferson Book Club on The Jefferson Hour, and the first book will be in February of 2019, 
It's Akil Reed Amar's book, The Constitution Today. And you can ask questions about the book if you've read it or if you just have a general question. Uh, the easiest way is to go to jeffersonhour.com and click on Ask a Question. Make note that it's about the book club. Now, all the other books are listed there. Plus, we'll be doing some interviews with authors like our favorite Joe Ellis. So this is a, a, a constant feature once every six or eight weeks on the Jefferson Hour, the Thomas Jefferson Book Club. We love to hear from you. Again, the Constitution today, and uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we need it by February 13th. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, everybody. Get reading. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week we're discussing, well, we're answering listener questions. A lot of response to The Jungle Grows Back by Robert Kagan, and I uh, did a Jefferson Watch essay about it, and I've been sort of promoting this book to anyone who will listen. Uh, we got one from Scott Blake who says, thanks very much for recommending the book. His belief that the relative world calm in recent decades is an aberration makes perfect sense given human nature. Um, Jefferson wouldn't like to hear that, I don't think. He's, uh, he goes on to say, I fear that many conservatives will be put off by his frequent use of the term liberal world order, failing to realize that he uses it to refer to progressive thoughts and policies instead of liberal American politics. That Bingo. That is a good insight and an important one. It, when he says liberal world order, he doesn't mean Nancy Pelosi and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. He means the set of uh, institutions and protocols that were established in the 20th century to keep people from each other's throats and to find peaceful ways to adjust differences and to arbitrate disputes and so on. It's not about liberal versus conservative. It's about a, a, a an expansive progressive view that humans can get along and they can settle their disputes in the UN or at The Hague, and they don't have to march armies against each other. But it's a good point. That's that's from Scott. That's an excellent distinction. S Scott Blake. And then we got one from Larry Williams. His subject is Book Club Suggestion, and he suggests the book The Hell of Good Intentions by Stephen M. Walt. Are you familiar with that? I don't know that. The Hell of Good Intentions by Stephen Walt? Uh, Stephen M. Walt. I'm writing this down. My hands are so numb David, yeah, that I can't it's, write. we got to get that football heater I, you know, I, again. I tried to fire it up. Yeah, it's too noisy. From his letter, like Edmund Burke, who warned, I dread our own power and our own ambition. I dread our being too much dreaded. Kagan, on this interview that I recently saw, was interesting. And he said that America is admired and feared, mostly admired, but partly feared, that we became the hegemon. We're the unipower. We're the sole great power left in the world, and everything else is subordinate. There's no... Soviet Union to counterbalance us or to chasten us, and that gives us this almost unprecedented amount of power. And on the whole, says Kagan, America uses that power thoughtfully and to maintain this liberal world order, but that our European friends fear us because he said, very interestingly, I just found this so fascinating, he said, thanks to the liberal world order, the Europeans don't have large armies or air forces, and they, they can protect themselves from an improbable attack by the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union. They, don't, they can't project power. And he said there's only one Western power that can project power in a big way across the globe, and that happens to be the United States, and Europe depends upon that. They depend upon our willingness or our ability to do that, but they also fear it, and they see that sometimes, and, and the case of the Iraq war is one of them, the European community did not want us to do this. France particularly did not want us to do this. The UN didn't want us to do this. Not even our friends in Britain really wanted us to do this. We did it, and now we know it was a mistake. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We destabilized the Middle East. We didn't fix any of the problems that we thought we were going to fix. In fact, we bred terror in all sorts of ways, including ISIS. And so the Europeans were saying to us, hey, the liberal order works in both directions. You're supposed to listen to us too, and we're warning you this is a very, very bad idea. So the Europeans admire us on the whole. 
they fear that much power in one nation. Let me go back to Larry Williams' letter. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm reading from a, uh, a New York Times book review of uh, this book, The Hell of Good Intentions, written by Jacob Heilbrun. And in his, in his review of the book, he says that um, – he asked the question, so how to rescue the superpower from its own miscues? Walt advocates what is known as offshore balancing. Offshore balancers, he says, believe that only a few areas of the globe are worth fighting to protect, with the Western Hemisphere paramount among them. This is the Monroe Doctrine, which Jefferson helped to formulate in 1823. It's also the Roosevelt corollary, Theodore Roosevelt, who said, if the Western Hemisphere is off limits to Europeans, then we're going to have to police it from time to time. I get that, but 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 there's an easier way, David. Go back to the Iraq War. Colin Powell said that his advocacy at the UN in two, in February 2003 was the greatest mistake of his life. That he didn't want to give that speech. He should have resigned. That would have alerted a lot of Americans to this. And and you can look at it this way: if we really believed in the UN, as we we helped to invent and we say we do, then if the UN said don't do it. It, it, it's not worth it. You should not do it. You certainly shouldn't do it alone. You have to bring back clear evidence of clear and present danger. This is why we exist, the UN. We exist to calm down states that are riled up. If we had listened to the UN and said, you know, we don't rule out that we're going to have to fight this war, but we are going to let you uh, force us to go through the process and really establish the weapons and to determine the range of alternatives to Saddam Hussein and, and how this will be taken regionally and so on. If we had hearkened to that idea that was created after the mayhem of World War II by Franklin Roosevelt and others, we would have avoided a $4 trillion disaster that has left 600,000 Iraqis dead, has uh, caused permanent disabilities for more than 40,000 Americans and killed almost 5,000 outright. In other words, there is a the liberal world order was in place, and had we hearkened to it, we might not have done this crazy thing. And so, I think I appreciate that review and that letter. But I think the idea is, if there's a liberal world order, we have to hearken to it also. I'd like another viewpoint. So I'm I'm real interested. I thank him for sending that. One more on Kagan's book from Paul Fisher. Uh, he thanks you for the recommendation and said he devoured the book in a single setting. Good. It's short. Uh, despite the fact that I tend to have a somewhat optimistic Jeffersonian view of government, too. I find that I do agree with Kagan's Hobbesian view of international relations. I look forward to hearing discussion of the book on the show. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about another book, Mortal Republic by Edward J. Watts. Are you familiar with this? No, never heard it of is, it. Uh, uh, it's, about, uh, it's a history of the, de the decline of the Roman Republic and the rise of Augustus. And he says, I would love to hear Mr. Jefferson discuss Watts' chronicle of events. And then he gives us a list of about 10 of them. Who, who's the, the writer? The writer uh, is, it's, the title again is Mortal Republic by Edward J. Watts. But who's the letter writer? Mr. Paul Fisher. Thank you. I'm going to order that book Immediately, I would order it from the barn, but my fingers are too numb. I'm going to get it. This is great. Hear Mr. Jefferson discuss uh, Watts' chronicle of events, of, which led to the collapse of the Roman Republic. I'll cite a few. Uh, two wars of great powers, uh, and a, a post-war economic boom, uh, later on popular wars. Anyway, I think it would be great Caesar. fun. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, this is one of my great fascinations, the end of the Roman Republic, the coming of the Roman Empire. And as you know, I go to Rome with students and teach there. Yeah, and you've, you've tried to help me a little bit to tutor me and suggest a couple of books to read. I'm, I'm still working on it. And Tacitus. 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 Yeah, yeah, Tacitus. Yeah. Um, another book, as long as we're on the subject, just quickly here. Um, this comes from Wayne R. Hudson. He recommends The Indispensable Man. Oh, that's a, a biography of George Washington by James, James Thomas, Flexner. Right, yes. That yeah. is a great biography. I got that. And he really liked it and wonders how it, we could inspire somebody like Ken Burns to do a a documentary well, on it. I mean, Ken Burns is his own... He's a good friend of genius, yours. You could call friend, him up, right? Yeah. I don't think he's <laughs> going to say, oh, great, I hadn't thought of that. Uh-huh. You know, he's, he thinks it through. He's a he's one of our supreme geniuses. Well, now we're going to go into a subject that we have touched on before, but before that, I have a fun one. All righty. Michael Blazewitz. 
Uh, not a question, but a suggestion. Another book? <laughs> uh, are Never you ready ends. to write? Yes, I am. Uh, this is. I have e- gloves on. Now. He he is currently reading Eager, The Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. Oh boy! A new book by Colorado author Ben Goldfarb. And what was that? Oh boy! You know, I have. <laughs> now, careful now, because I'm going to tell you something. Okay, but before you do, All this, right. let me say, I have a friend who lives in. The Midwest, and she's a brilliant um, marketer, PR type, helps entities figure out their brand and so on. She loves beavers. She has a collection of like 50 or 60 books and stuffed uh, taxidermy beavers and figurines and art and, and posters and you name it, keychains. And she sent me a couple of years ago, like 10 books about the history of beaver hats and the beaver trade and beaver trapping. <laughs> I have North Dakota's largest beaver-related library they already. Are, listen, they are already. amazing creatures if you start to study them. Nature's all. dam builders. I have not read this book, but Eager, I can tell you. <laughs> Eager Beaver, The Secret Life of Beavers. Right. I can tell you that it is on my favorite reader's nightstand. So I'll, oh I'll get an inside review on that. What is the the, the author? Uh, the author is Ben Goldfarb. Oh, Goldfarb. Okay. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm the editor of We Proceeded On, the Lewis and Clark Quarterly Journal. I'm going to have somebody review it. Perhaps Perhaps your spouse. Sometime, um, I'll have to tell you the inside story of me helping Bob Newcomb check his beaver traps in northern Minnesota. Have you ever – what's the closest you ever were to a live beaver? Mm, Ten feet. Yeah, me, Five, 10, 10, 15 feet. feet. This I've would seen be, them in, This would be in a, a small creek uh, out in western North Dakota. They're amazing creatures. Yeah, they are. And we almost – hunted them to extermination. Mm-hmm. They've made a huge comeback. And now we know what they didn't know in Jefferson's and Lewis and Clark's well, time, well, that they help create healthy bioregions that and, we need. And, and they still do. They're amazing. Anyway, so thank you for that, Michael Blazewitz. We appreciate it. David, I was I was just contemplating trying to order it so that maybe it could be droned in by the time well, a drone couldn't fly in this weather. But anyway, yeah, I'm, you, I'm getting you the You need book. something to scrape the ice off your phone there? Or off my fingers, okay. please. Yeah. My lips. Um, we have many more letters. I'd like to buzz through a Alrighty. few more of them. Uh, Dallas Cole writes, he works with a company called Liquid US, which is working to change the incentives of our electoral system and give more influence to voters. We believe that the problems of our system stem in part from the elections themselves. Even if 60% of the people vote for the representative, 40% are still unrepresented, even though 60% will often disagree with the candidate who won. You know what? Democracy's messy, right? And How would w- you respond to this? You know, you hear this, of course, by lots of different voices saying, We have this sacred right that doesn't exist in most countries even now to vote, and an astonishingly small percentage of people actually do vote. And then you wonder uh, why that should be when when we have this enormous tool that we can throw all the rascals out or change the course of our government at almost any time, and we don't – all take advantage of it. And so in some places like Australia, there are fines if you don't vote. Uh, you know, we toy with this sort of thing. But the, the, the basic American attitude, if I can just try to describe it in a nutshell, is I can't be bothered unless my ox has been gored. Get away from me. I'm trying to buy stuff at Walmart and I'm trying to watch stuff on television or my device. I'm not interested except insofar as I get riled up about it. But I, I do not want to be involved in foreign policy discussions or discussions about infrastructure or anything else. I just want it to be done in a beautiful way that doesn't overtax me, doesn't overregulate me, and keeps the stuff coming. I know that sounds like a sarcastic caricature, but I think it's actually the view of the American people. In a certain way, it's great. We've been so blessed as a nation that people can afford to be kind of indifferent about it, but I think we're finding out now that there is a lot at stake on both in both parties and, and in every possible issue. And so people are needing to get back into the engagement because if we don't take charge of our lives, the the tiny – I'll be talking about this in the Jefferson Watch. If we don't take charge of our lives, there are people who are plenty eager to do it. Well, I don't exactly understand um, what it is they're, they're, they're – um suggesting um again it's uh, the letters from Dallas Cole and he's he's talking about um 
uh, liquid U.S. or liquid us. Um, and he says under liquid democracy, instead of electing one person from a small group of people, you can choose anyone to represent you, friends, family, professors, etc. You select multiple people and rank them in order of preference and can assign people on an issue by issue basis. And he uh, gives us a link if we'd like to talk to somebody or learn more about it. But I, I would to like me, to learn more about it. To me, it's like a bigger issue. And it's, you know, it, it, <laughs> One of the catchphrases in the last month is, "Wow, you're going to build, you're going to take a medieval solution to a modern problem, right?" Well, let's flip that around. I mean, if Jefferson was here, or the founding fathers were here, and they had access to the immense technological uh, advances that we have, don't you think they would come up with a better way to to represent ourselves? Yes. So, there, I mean, Europe has proportional representation. We've rejected that here. Britain and Canada and Australia and New Zealand have parliamentary systems where you can vote a vote of confidence or no confidence when you feel that your leaders are not adequately representing you. This is a new idea that's much looser. But does it have to be one form of government for all? Yes. Why? Because maybe... Montana can have its form and Texas can have its and Florida a third. That's the laboratory of democracy idea. So it's a state-by-state state situation. But in the nation, you have to do certain things, declare war, make coins, have a federal reserve, tax, uh, adjust disputes. But, the, but these aren't the things that people really disagree about. No, but I'm saying that you do need – a sovereign, and the people are sovereign in America, but they've but they've released part of their sovereignty to government. And Hamilton and Washington and the Federalists and even Jefferson knew there needs to be a unified way of going about certain national and international affairs. But the glory of our system is that every state gets to decide medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, neither, prohibition or no prohibition, uh, generous abortion rights or, or no abortion rights, uh, blue laws or no blue laws, um, 85 mile an hour um, speed limit or 45 mile an hour. This Each state gets to choose, and that's part of the genius of our system. Forgive me for coming at this uh, in sort of a naive way. I'm just trying to provoke you into answering it. And what is, you, and what's the did. question I'm uh, ducking here? Yeah, well, no, you're not. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's good always to think out of the box um, about this. And we, we did have a discussion um, not that long ago that's kind of stuck with me, and that was um, you really felt that the Senate was not working. In other words, North Dakota should not have two senators when California only has two senators. That, that is correct. And I also think the cloture rule is, and the filibuster rules are a mistake. The Senate is a democratic body. If 51% is 51%. Sometimes one party benefits from 60, another time another. But that wasn't the intention of the founding fathers to, to require super majorities. I think that we need to really rethink our basic constitutional structure. And furthermore, I mean, if, if 85% of the American people want some form of, say, gun restriction and Congress, our elected body of representation, says we're not interested, we won't do it, there has to be some way in which clear majorities, not simple majorities, but clear majorities are listened to and their, and their will is enacted into law. It's not for this handful of people to stand between the people and their own sovereignty. This happens on taxation. This happens on health care. It happens to happen in this case on uh, weaponry and the Second Amendment. But you cannot ignore the will of the American people when it's so easy to determine that will. In Jefferson's time, we had almost no way of determining what was the will of the people. Today, we know what the people want. We have polls. We have institutions that canvass these things. We have the Internet. People can write their congressperson. We are in a position to really listen to the voice of the people, and our government often fails to do it. And that is a, that is a problem in democratic theory. And so that's about making this system work, not necessarily... Uh, abandoning it for s liquid democracy or some other approach, our system's not working even in the way that it's supposed to work under its existing constitutional structure. That's, I think, appalling. We need to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. It's Clay Jenkinson. I want to invite you to come on the John Steinbeck Cultural Tour in Monterey, California, March 2nd through 8th, 2019. You know, I do these cultural tours on the Lewis and Clark Trail in Jefferson's, Virginia, and soon Jefferson's, France. But the one that's immediately in front of us is John Steinbeck's America in California, in Monterey, 2 through 8 March, 2019. Go to the website jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours and you can get all the information. Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, The Red Pony, Cannery Row of Mice and Men, and we'll be visiting some of the most extraordinary places on the coastline of California. We'll see you there. Welcome back to this Sub-Zero edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm sitting across from David Swenson, the, semi, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson, who will not let me fire up the NFL sideline propane burner that could warm this barn up. Even the cattle uh, are begging for it. it. The tough cattle it are begging. Yeah. Yeah, you tough it out. I got a couple of quick questions that All right. are fun ones. We got one from Susanna Ordry. She's uh, studied quite a bit at uh, William & Mary. Oh, good. And uh, was reintroduced to colonial America and that Renaissance man, as she puts it, Thomas Jefferson. My reason for writing is a clarifying point in an episode, uh, 1231, Jefferson's Garden. Pat Radowski is describing a melon, and I cannot discern its name despite countless rewindings. Any information you are able to provide is most appreciated. It's spelled N-O-I-R. Noir. D-E-S. Des. C-A-R-M-E-S. Carmes. Noir des Carmes melon. Okay, and so have you looked that up? That's an actual melon? I have. Once again, uh, 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 Susanna, your spelling is N-O-I-R-D-E-S. C A R M E S. Noir des Canas. And melon. It, what is it? It's a. It's an it's, edible melon. Well, let me tell you. I'm just sorry. I'm just <laughs> eager, eager to know. You can find seeds for this at my favorite spot, uh, Seed Savers Exchange, and my my baby sister Susie just gave me another annual membership. That was it's, good of her. It's out in Iowa. It's great. Um, they have a great website, and you can find the seeds there. And it says a true French cantaloupe. Name for the Carmelite monks who once tended it in France. One of the easiest to grow and most luxurious of all melons. Rich black green skin when immature, ripening to uh, orange mottled with green, sweet aromatic. And according to what Pat said, it's it, there's like a window where you, you are supposed to harvest them for the greatest sweetness. They almost crack when right when they're ready to be I think harvested. I've had one at Monticello uh-huh. when I took some friends to the garden and she served us a lovely little garden picnic. Pat's the person. Uh, sounds great. So now our friend knows the nature of that melon and we thanks to your research you were able to solve this problem. Well, it wasn't much research, but I, I did find it, yeah. Peggy Davis wrote to us. <laughs> it's funny. There's a there's a section in there. How do you pronounce your name? And and pronunciation. Peggy Davis. Try and mispron- mispronounce it. Almost. Um, I always listen to your promo every week, reminding us that the Jefferson Hour is upcoming, and I wonder what always with an air to the Enlightenment means. As an air, as in a tune, an air. An air? <laughs> I've finally gotten around to asking and getting the book club list. Heir to the Enlightenment. He was a child of the Enlightenment. He, we inherited the Enlightenment. It began in France and Scotland and in England, and it made its way across the Atlantic. And the two great American exemplars are Benjamin Franklin and our hero, Thomas Jefferson. So he was an heir like the heir to an estate. Well, when you say always with an heir to the Enlightenment, you're saying H-E-I-R? Like we owe it to the Enlightenment, or it's always connected to the Enlightenment, or is it fun English, or what? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> what I mean is always with some focus on the Enlightenment that Jefferson – That I, I, I've just been reading about the Enlightenment. I'm doing this project, David, involving the Italian humanist and Enlightenment philosopher named Beccaria. And Beccaria wrote a famous treatise on crimes and punishment. Jefferson was fond of it. He used it as he revised the law code of Virginia. And this is news to, to everyone, but even to you. I've been invited to go to Milan in November, Milan, Italy, wow. to have a conversation with a Beccaria, a Beccaria pretender. 
and I'm going to write the outline, and there's going to be this conversation between the Italian. Oh, you better tape that. Well, you should come. But anyway, uh, my point is that the Enlightenment is the most important thing that really ever happened to the world, with the possible exception of the birth of Jesus. And the Enlightenment liberated humankind. It, it gave us free speech. It gave us freedom of religion. It, it, it gave uh, the, the franchise to people that had never had it before. It reformed institutions. It taught us that science is our only oracle. So what you're really saying is with a nod of with a, with, with a constant appreciation of the great Enlightenment, capital E, that has given the world its best chance at happiness and success. Thank you for that question, Peggy Davis. One more from Paul Kerner, um, and he, he talks about he, – he, he is a well-read Jefferson uh, scholar. Um, and his question is, what is your favorite book on the life of our third president? Yes. And also, when will you be in Ohio? <laughs> when invited, I will go to Ohio. I love Ohio. And he says at the end, P.S., I believe in the barn. Come warm it up. Yeah, you would believe it today because— Let's, let's go to the studio. My fingers time. are okay. blue. In the, you know, I saw a cow that had already—it it, it had wrapped itself in white wrapping paper. That's how cold <laughs> it is. That That is not good. So Anyway, he has—the uh, most recent one he's read is Peterson— um, Which is a great book, Merrill Peterson, Thomas Jefferson and the New Nation. It's, he it's says my he has Jefferson copies Bible. Of every major Jefferson theme book that has ever been published. Well, I love Peterson's Thomas Jefferson and the New Nation. Um, Dumas Malone's six volume Jefferson is great. It's not for the faint of heart because it's six volumes. He says that he was given that as a Christmas present this year from his wife. Well, that's a great gift, and you can buy them at, at, at discounted prices on um, Amazon and ABE Books. Dot com. I also uh, think that uh, that our friend Joseph Ellis's American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson, is outstanding. I think that um, Elf Maps, two volumes uh, of Thomas Jefferson, Elf Map Jr., is excellent. Uh, Meacham's book is not my favorite, but it's good. And then John Bowles of Rice University has a recent Jefferson, which I think is outstanding. In, in a sense, you can't go wrong, but... For me, the book that I started with and the book that I come back to again and again is uh, Merrill Peterson. And I should say as a, as a, as a final note that Fawn Brody's Jefferson and Intimate History, published in the 1970s, is actually an extraordinarily insightful account of the inner life of the third president of the United States. And although she was denounced at the time for reopening the Sally Hemings story, she has, of course, uh, been vindicated – um, in a big way ever since. Let me just take a moment before we go on here that, to say how much we appreciate hearing from listeners, how much we appreciate you sending in questions. If you'd like to send President Jefferson or Clay Jenkinson a question, go to jeffersonhour.com and click on Ask President Jefferson. It's pretty simple to do. You can find out more about the show there, additional content, and if you'd like to, you can support the show. Uh, we're coming up on, uh, it's almost time for the essay. There's a number of letters that I wish we could have gotten to this week. We'll do one more. Do one short one. Let's do rapid fire. Diane Brakevotny and Travis Larkin both wrote on the same subject. And um, she says, I really enjoy the show. And please post a picture of your new ukulele. And Travis says, I would love to see a picture of uh, Kevin Moiterman's ukulele. It doesn't seem to be an instrument he normally creates. I will do that. I will send you, David, if I get home tonight. I'm not even sure my car will start. I will take a photograph if my camera even works in this kind of cold. <laughs> and I will send it to you by the electronification of the world. And then you and your web friend can post it, I will pretend that I'm playing it, and maybe you can back it with some actual high-quality ukulele Oh, that take sound. all the fun right out of it. Right. Well, <laughs> I will send a photograph. I, I would love to see it. I, I'm hoping that at some point when it warms up that you'll you'll bring it in. You know, I'm going to bring it in, and, and I'm going to pluck it a couple of bars, and then you're going to play it. Now, do you have do you have somebody that's going to instruct you? Do you buy one of those Mel Bay guitar books for ukulele? The person or? who's going to instruct me is speaking to me at this moment. His <laughs> name is David Swenson. Oh, we'll you talk. can play a ukulele. Oh, I, maybe if I had a couple of hours to mess. But with I mean, it, you, you know? can pick up an instrument. This is true. You can pick up an instrument and pick out a tune. Well, it's just 
it's chord formations, and your fingers have to be able to know where they go. I got nothing. Uh, you know, any sound you make is wonderful. So you know, um, sunny side of the street. That's all I want to do. Something. Grab your yeah, coat something. and get your hat. Yeah. And leave your that, worries sir. on the doorstep. And with yeah, that, sir, exactly. it is. Uh, thank you for a wonderful conversation, and it is now time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Thank you, David. This one's called America in Darkness. I went to see the movie Vice the other night. My daughter urged me to see it. Generally speaking, I don't like going to movies about people who are still alive. That always feels unfair to me. Not enough time has passed to give us the kind of perspective we need. Vice is a snarky postmodern biopic about former Vice President Richard Cheney of Wyoming. Cheney, born in 1941, is somehow still alive after five heart attacks spanning his entire adulthood and a full-on heart transplant successfully performed in 2012. Cheney is portrayed in the film by actor Christian Bale, who won the Golden Globe Award for his excellent portrayal under an amazing and almost unbelievable Hollywood makeover. But Bale weakened his triumph at the Golden Globes by thanking Satan for inspiring his award-winning performance. The film is 132 minutes long, but it felt like three hours in the theater. I saw the film four days ago, and I am still trying to claw my way out of a deep citizen's depression. I'm not being cute here. I cannot remember ever feeling so perfectly disheartened and disillusioned and disturbed by a depiction of America's role in the world. All I can say is this. I do not want to live in that America. I do not want to live in a nation that wages war by way of no-bid contracts awarded to companies closely associated with the very politicians who make decisions about raining down destruction on real and perceived or even made-up enemies around the world. The Cheney-Halliburton connection exemplifies what I most dislike about modern America, the revolving door of politicians who leave office and walk immediately into obscenely lucrative careers with corporations specializing in the dark arts. I do not want to live in a nation where the military-industrial petroleum complex has more power than all three branches of our government combined, where politicians are willing agents of secret power clusters that operate without any significant oversight. I do not want to live in a nation where men like Cheney direct men like Scooter Libby to destroy the career of CIA operative Valerie Plame, the wife of Richard Wilson, merely because her husband, who went to Africa to determine whether Iraq's Saddam Hussein was obtaining uranium ore from the nation of Niger, came back with a report that Dick Cheney and the warmongers of the G.W. Bush administration did not want to hear. I do not want to live in a nation where our leaders behave like ruthless and indifferent autocrats, operating without any serious legal, moral, or constitutional restraints, and then mask their naked Machiavellian and Hobbesian actions under a thin smear of civics that allows the rest of us to believe somehow that we still live in something that can be called a democracy. I do not want to live in a nation that hypes or fakes or invents justifications for waging war against real or perceived enemies. Colin Powell has said that his performance at the United Nations in February 2003 making the best of a very weak case for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, was the single most shameful moment of his life. And yet I do live in that country, and so do you. If you want to understand the way the world really works, read Stephen Hayes' Cheney, The Untold Story of America's Most Powerful and Controversial Vice President, or Peter Baker's Days of Fire, Bush and Cheney in the White House. When I came out of the movie theater, I drove to a tavern and ordered a beer. But I could not finish my beer. I know the film is a caricature and a hatchet job, but I know, too, that it provides a largely correct window on the way the world really works, particularly the post-9-11 world. I have long thought that Dick Cheney was the dark star of American political life in my time. I try never to oversimplify complex questions, and I hate the tendency we all now have to demonize people and institutions we don't agree with. Dick Cheney, after all, was elected five times to the U.S. House of Representatives. 
He served as White House Chief of Staff under Gerald Ford. He was for eight years the elected Vice President of the United States. He was in the Situation Room on 9-11, one of the most terrifying and confusing days in American history. Mr. Cheney has had access to intelligence reports that are denied to mere citizens like me. Cheney's essential message during the dark Bush years, with the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, extraordinary renditions, waterboarding, enhanced interrogation, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, the Patriot Act, and much more was, and I'm quoting, If you knew what I know, you would understand why we do what we do. If you knew what I know, you would understand why we do what we do. I have felt through much of that time that he's probably right that you and I are blessed to live with the illusion of participatory democracy, with the illusion that America is a benign and reluctant hegemon, with the illusion that we can usually behave like a due process republic in a somewhat troubled world. Cheney may be right. I dare say he is probably right that the world is dramatically more dangerous and dark than is dreamt of in your or my philosophy, Horatio. Radical Islam has some reasons to be angry with America, but a radical movement that beheads American journalists on television, that uses DeWalt power tools to drill holes into the brains of its enemies on television, that bombs a pizza parlor in Israel on a Tuesday night or a Paris nightclub filled with mere civilians who have little or no linkage to geopolitics— is not likely to respond to the Jeffersonian-Wilsonian mantras of the United Nations or the terms of the Geneva Conventions. But I thought we did. We conformed to those processes and those restraints. And I was wrong. Dick Cheney is not asking us to wake up and smell the IED, the improvised explosive device, just the opposite. He is asking us to go on about our business without thinking too much about the way the world really works or asking any inconvenient questions because, like his brother, Colonel Nathan R. Jessup, in A Few Good Men, Cheney's reply is, you can't handle the truth. Maybe Dick Cheney is right, but I still don't want to live in that world. I want to be Canada. I want to be Sweden. I want to be Scotland. I want us to be a quiet, rational, enlightened nation that edges away from darkness. I continue to be a Jeffersonian, though perhaps a chastened and disillusioned one. The great Jefferson believed we can, if we educate ourselves liberally and work hard at it, be our best selves much of the time. That is my mission statement for me and for all of you. We can, if we work hard at it and continue to educate ourselves, be our best selves much of the time. If I have here described the world behind our illusions correctly, The proper response is not to move to Canada or shrug our shoulders as we walk into Walmart or Costco, but to take back our Jeffersonian Republic one vote at a time. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888 828 2853. Again, that number is 888 828 2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.